Some of those people, when they realized that they weren't desperately needed, decided that they had other things they needed to do in life. So we're down to, I think, 11 people in the end? Uh, 10, nine. 10 people in the end. Um, so the uh, process through which we decided that we're going to go is to have um, the candidates each come. I guess you could consider them candidates, the volunteers each come. Uh, some of them tonight, Tuesday night, some of them Thursday night. Um, we're going to give them each an opportunity to first speak for a minute or two, two minutes, telling us a little bit about themselves. Um, and then after that, we have questions which the board members have pulled together. We're going to look over and figure out, um, maybe even before we get started, which questions we're going to use tonight. Um, we'll have one question that we'll start with each of the different, um, each of you, and then we'll go on that same question. We'll go to the next person and the next person. How long will we give for each of those questions? Each question, three minutes. Okay. Three minutes for each person to respond? For each person or not. I have a little warning sign <laughs> here. Each of you will get, uh, get, get to be the first on one of the questions and the second on the next question like that. Um, then in the end, we'll give you a chance to either make um, a little summary statement or else to um, tell us something else that you haven't had the opportunity to say. Um, and I think that will pull our, our meeting to an end tonight. Um, and then we'll go through much the same process Thursday night. And then subsequent to that, the board members will each have a chance to um, come up with a decision or concept of who it is that we think would be the uh, best person to join us on the board. Let me um, actually mention two other things before we get started. Um, one is I want to congratulate Kelly, the member of our board who did resign. We miss having her, but she got a $1.5 million grant at Canisius um, to help. It's called the Justice Grant. She and some other co- I don't know what they call investigators. She and I think two other people. It's called the Justice Grant. And it's to do research on teaching math to special education students and helping teachers learn how to do that uh, particularly well, which is, I think, just very exciting. So though we miss her, she has a huge job ahead of her working on that program, and we hope she can come back and help us with some grant writing. Um, she told us in her free time, I don't think she probably has much free time, but she could perhaps work on that. Um, the next thing that I just wanted to make a little bit of a comment about, um, and, and you guys can interject if you'd like, what we're looking for in the way of a board member. Um, of course, we want someone honest, enthusiastic, hardworking. Uh, we want someone who hopefully knows the school district. Um, and I think that that's truly the case for the majority of our candidates, if not all of our candidates. Loves the school district and worries and hopes and to keep it as healthy as possible and our students as healthy as possible. We're looking for someone who has time to put into this or can make the time, which ends up being evenings. Um, you know, evenings for meetings and things like that. It ends up being participating and going to events at the school, games and concerts and things like that. And sometimes it ends up being daytime things, uh, lunches with the students, 
um, gatherings with some of the teachers, things like that. So we want someone who hopefully um, will be able to um, not give up the rest of their life to do this, but be able to come up with um, the time to do that. We want someone who can hopefully, you know, who we can work together with. Being on the board is not an independent um, issue. It's, a, it's an absolutely a collaborative process. And we want someone who we all can work closely with, that we can all, you know, we all have different ideas, but we all will have a chance to chat with each other and try to help learn from each other's ideas. And it's a collaboration not just with the other members of the board, but with the administration and also um, with the school district and the community at large. Is that probably fair? Is that what we're looking for? Um, and we think this person is hopefully someone who can be with us um, at least through the elections in the spring. And before that, I think is that pretty much all we have to cover at the moment? We need to look at the questions. Um, each of you, I think, um, we need to come up with, and we don't have to tell what the questions are, that will give away the punch. But if you guys each have particularly a particular question that you find that you really want to want to um, ask, if you guys have a chance to look at them, do you have a good feel, feeling mad about something you would? No, we have ten questions. Then. Say again. Are we doing all ten questions? No, we're not going to do all ten questions. What are we going to do? We have four people up here. Should we do four we questions? We do maybe uh, five. Five to six questions. Five to six questions. We'll probably push about six questions. I think it also depends how the evening's going. But I'd say yeah, six questions. <coughs> now, so if each of you guys pick one. I'll defer. So Holly, you can you can do show can can we just let you know which ones are Holly? I'm gonna circle the ones you choose. Okay, Holly, do you uh, yeah, if somebody Holly has number you, six. Holly would like number six, okay. Anybody else particular question that you want to five minutes again. <laughs> what are you going with? <laughs> I'll do seven. Two rooms. Okay, well, good evening, board members. I appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. Um, I, you know, I've come from an extensive background. I obviously served on the board for a while. My daughter went to school at Hamburg. Um, my wife also served on the board, so I've had a, a lot of board knowledge to bring between her and myself. And uh, extensively, I served on the advisory committee for finance, and I also was uh, very active as a taxpayer. That's how I, I came onto the school board. 
But I guess the big question in a room for uh, for me was, well, why do I want to run again, and why do I want to get involved in this? And I consider this running. I mean, it's, I like this competition. That's probably a better way to do an election. But uh, I really came about that uh, I thought I could bring something to the school board uh, for a very complex year on budgeting. Uh, I deal a lot with budgeting out of the Erie County Ledge when I was there. I did a, a billion dollar budget and also was very involved with the school board budget. And finance is one of my strong points in looking at budgets and trying to get a good budget for the community, especially the 2% sales tax we have, or cap tax we have now. I also, uh, the one, one big reason that I really want to run is um, I kind of really miss working with the kids in a school and understanding the kids. I work part time right now, my daughter's gone, I only have grandkids. Uh, they're out there in New Jersey, in fact, and uh, I think I bring, I'd like to see some uh, opportunity for myself to get more involved in our education process because I think that's one of our roots uh, right now that we're overlooking in, in the community and in society. I think education needs an even stronger emphasis right now, and I think we're getting away from that. And by getting away from that, we're losing our competitiveness in the global economy, and we're losing our competitiveness of what our kids do when they graduate. So those are my two big reasons to get in here. Uh, and I only have a couple seconds left, but I, again, appreciate the opportunity and I wish all the candidates best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. I'll take it from here. Okay. Um, as all of you know, I'm Craig Lopez, uh, the latest former member of the Board of Education here in Hamburg. And um, the reason I decided to throw my letter of interest back in is because um, I know where we're at I think it's time to continue right-sizing the district. I think that our kids deserve it. I, I am a parent in the district. Um, I don't want to see. I don't want to see any more cuts. Yet we have to be realistic with the, the funds, especially what Bob talks about with the uh, tax gap coming. So we need to be cognizant of that. Trim where we can. Keep what we can, and uh, move forward. I also believe that all of these folks sitting here and then the, the uh, six more on Thursday night um, want to do the best for this district and for the kids in this district. And anyone who says that anything different uh, is wrong. So this is a good group of people and I, I'd like to join back on. Um, my name is Joanna Erickson, and uh, I have lived here since uh, 1995, moved from Houston. My girls went to school here, Charlotte Avenue Middle School and certainly the high school. My youngest, Rachel, graduated last year, so I am officially that empty nester, and I don't like it. It's <laughs> terrible. Um, but I love Hamburg, and I love the schools. I've been involved right from the beginning. Um, Started out with uh, Sarah in first grade and just kind of seeing what they had offered Charlotte Avenue and then I realized, you know what, I want to find out more. Got involved in PTA, served as president there, then headed over to the middle school and then I wanted to know what was going on, so I got involved, PTA president there. Went to the high school, same thing, kind of led the way um, for a group of friends. And the more I got involved, the more I enjoyed it. I had the opportunity to serve um, on the budget ambassadors for three years, and I um, sat on a number of different interview committees for uh, a couple of superintendents that we've hired, and for um, director of instruction, and uh, I've done building principals. I've done actual teacher interviews at the middle school, so I've kind of seen a lot of different things ins and outs. I also, uh, being a parent and uh, involved in my girls' activities, as well as the other functions with the different jobs and things that I've had, I'm involved with parents and parents talk to each other. And that's how you know what the, what's going on, what they know, what they don't know. And as a representative of the parents, that's why my interest is here, to be a participant on the school board right Thanks. Super. Hi, and last but not least, I'm Catherine Lee. And I had moved all the way to West Hunnick at one point in my life, and the umbilical cord pulled me back. 
when we moved back to the area, it was a choice of either we're uh, living in the Frontier District or the Hamburg District. And 28 years ago when we moved back, being a Frontier grad, um, I was leaning toward Frontier. And I looked at the school districts very closely. Where were my children going to get the best education? And I chose Hamburg. And at the time, it was an incredible district. There was unity. There was um, there's a cohesiveness amongst the staff, amongst the teachers, and we've lost that. I was a parent, then I was a non-traditional student when my children went off to college, and I became a teacher, and I've worked in the district for the past 12 years. I was a Frontier intern for a year, or a Fredonia intern, and then worked in the district for the past 12 years. And I've seen a trend that has not been a very comfortable thing to watch. I'm seeing staff not happy with staff, not happy with administration. And we've got to come back together. And I don't have the finance backgrounds, but I have the, the background of the cultures of each and every building in this district for the past, past 12 years. They're very different. The socioeconomic factors are different from building the building. The staff is different. The parental units are different. The needs. So we need to get back to a community that we can be proud of, that we're a district that we can be proud of, and get back together. Thank you. Uh, begin with the first question from, <coughs> with Greg. Are folks asking their own question? Tom, you're on. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> In, uh, in preparing the 2012-13 district budget, revenues will be limited by a 2% tax cap. Uh, describe how you believe the board should address the 2012 budget issues to stay within the 2% limit. closest to the to the bone on the, on the kid and then uh, we also need to well clearly we need to listen to the teachers needs um, but we also need to understand that with revenues going down and expenses rising every year with uh, uh, well we know that 70 70 to 74 percent is payroll we have to be careful in that regard as well so we got a lot of number crunching to do. We've got uh, we've got to listen to a lot of different people, but uh, it's not going to be an easy year again. And I'm sure we're going to be all uh, listening to the same uh, troubles going forward. A lot of listening. Certainly, I agree with everything that Greg just had to say. Um, <clears throat> I can remember when I was on the budget ambassadors, and I understand that it's different now than when I was on it, which I'm really appreciative of because the information wasn't as forthcoming as I would have liked to have seen it at that time. And one of the things that we kept requesting and wasn't necessarily given to us was to see the actual spending. Um, it was great to see, you know, what limited money was coming in, but not seeing the actual spending in each category wasn't doing us any good. So I think that's just another thing, another piece of the puzzle that has to be really looked at um, very closely once again. And um, no, it's not going to be easy. It never is easy. I mean, our whole economy is in a, a state of flux right now. Um, but I think that if we do do the listening and we do do the research and we follow through with the ideas that are talked about and see what we can do to move forward and to present a budget to the community and with, with no hiding anything and being as um, informative as we can in giving them all of the information that they so desire and that they crave. They want to know. They want to know everything. Um, and if we can be that forthcoming, I think it will help 
the overall uh, presentation and um, will help us in the long run in establishing that budget for the following year. Oh, I wish I had an answer. I, I had, um, there was a time in my life that I would spend a dollar on three cans of SpaghettiOs and eat half a can a day and hope someone invited me to dinner on the seventh day. And it was tough getting out of being that poor and having to budget that one dollar or hope you found a quarter on the floor that you could buy something at work. Um, and it was tough getting out of that. Money management, how to budget, and finding out that when the electric company says they're going to turn your electricity off if you don't pay it, and they mean it. Um, I just wish that there was a, a better way that we can be more open, that we would get a better turnout for a board meeting. People have to know what our problems are to be part of the solution. If you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And if they don't get involved, if they don't understand what's going on, and this divisiveness continues, we're, we're not going to be able to present a budget that's going to be helpful. It didn't much answer your question, but that's the best I have on that one. Well, there is an advantage of going last, so uh, I appreciate the advantage on this question. <laughs> um, you know, having dealt with a lot of budgets over the years, um, I got to say this to the group, and, and it's probably one of the hardest things is, is really set your priorities. Uh, you have to come together as a school board right now, sit down and talk and put your priorities together and say, okay, this is what we're looking at. And then you have to start looking at the revenues coming in, whether it's sales tax revenues or whether it's state revenues, um, because obviously the state will start the state budget coming in too, and that's all part of the process. And then I would take a look at the, the uh, areas that, everybody says we ought to cut areas, but we actually have got to become more efficient. Maybe it's our transportation costs, we have a, a new contract for transportation, but how to go after those transportation costs. How to take a better look at the use of our sports facilities out there so we can maybe save some costs there. You know, this is a deep dive when you go into budgets. You really have to put it on spreadsheets. You have to sit there and take a look at the classroom sizes. You have to take a look at everything. Um, dealing with budgets over the years, that's what I'd have to say that you would need as information as board members. You have to get in it and take a look at what the school districts are spending in schools. Not only as a school district, but as schools. What's happening in Boston Valley, which is out farther, what the costs are, and stuff like this. Those are the tough choices we have to make with a 2% cap right now. And those are the things we have to look at. And um, sales tax, uh, if our dollar keeps going down, obviously our sales tax revenue goes up. It's always helpful in the budget. Steve knows that coming out because the Canadians come over. But I really think that we need to do some lobbying with the state because that affects our upcoming budget too as the state lobbying coming out here. And they're, in the, uh, they're going to be under the gun again because they put this on us. Now they're going to have to show us how we're going to do it. So that would be another thing is to do some extensive lobbying on this budget. suggest these reductions take place and are there any areas that you would consider untouchable? Well, I'm not even a member of the board and you're asking me that question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think you have to do um, the listening again. You've got to hear from those building principals. Find out what's working, what's not working in the building because they are so different. And um, as far as what would be untouchable, well, obviously, core curriculum is untouchable. Special education is untouchable. Um, there's not a good answer for that question. Mm -hmm. And obviously, we're all in that position. You've been, you've been in that position the past couple of years. And I don't want to say that things weren't handled well, I don't want to say that they were handled badly. I'm not going to call anybody out on that. Things were handled in a way that unfortunately did some damage to the reputation of our district. That I can say comfortably. Um, would I ever want to see something play out like that again? No. 
are some of these things cuts necessary? Of course, we all know that. Um, somebody's going to lose a job. Uh, some family's going to be hurt. And uh, some students are going to be upset. Um, and the parents in the community are going to question and wonder why. And I think, again, it comes back down to uh, full disclosure. And uh, that's the most important thing, really, to me, is being able to explain to the satisfaction of anybody in this community who asks why. And as a board, and as that representative, that is our job and responsibility to report to the community. <coughs> so I'm just going to leave it at that. It's a tough decision. Um, we all have to make them. I just hope that we can do it in a way that is um, professional and, of course, in the best interest of the students and of me. from time to time from various educators throughout the district as I've been in for substituting that uh, some of the courses or um, uh, what's the word I want to write? The you know, the curriculum, some of the meetings that they all go to give me the word. Teachers, give me a word. <laughs> education, the teacher education. Yeah, staff the, development. The, the staff professional development. Staff development. Staff Thank you, staff development. Yeah. The staff development courses, they come back, they've been ineffective, they haven't answered the questions that they wanted answered, and they come back and they say, what a waste of money that was for the district. Nothing had been taught, nothing had been learned out of, out of those staff development days. And not only have you had to spend the money on the staff development and the educator and the time, but now you've had to spend, if there are <coughs> 50 teachers involved in these, you've spent 50 substitute pays that day. That has to be looked at. That has to be, what is the most important meetings? I've heard there are meetings like crazy. There's a shortage of substitutes. There's substitutes that can't be found. Um, you're paying more substitute pay. There's got to be a way to cut back in the, some of those areas. Uh, a few years ago, Boston Valley actually had a grant when Mr. Pearlstein was still there that every child in the building got breakfast every single day. So there's uh, there are grants out there. There are programs like that out there. And they found that at the end of the year, the study showed that the children did better that year. Some children came in with no breakfast. They got breakfast. They followed the, the testing, attendance, everything all year, and it went up. There are things like that available if we go to search for them. And if we can get Ms. Harper to help write a grant or two, that would be great. Untouchable, well, the remedials. If anything, we need more remedial. Um, some of the remedial teachers don't even get their, their full lunches because they're grabbing kids when they know they can. They're eating at their desks, they're eating at their tables. <coughs> they're not getting uh, planning periods because they know that child needs that help and that's the only time we can get them. Uh, it, hiring more isn't, isn't popular, but if you do it at all, it's gotta be in those areas. Obviously, it's a very tough question for, you know, with limited information, but uh, I'll put this out there, that the state mandates, a lot of them are untouchable. We have a retirement system, we have to pay for it, that's an untouchable system that's uh, dictated to us, and we have some union contracts being within a framework of what the union contract requires us to do, uh, whether it's classroom size or something like this. Those are all something untouchable. All the rest of that, we have to start looking outside the area. We really got to start looking outside the box and how we're taking a look at the, our whole system. You know, you know, I ran um, at Ford Motor Company, I ran the FTPM, a program that we went out there and we took a look at uh, and questioned everything we did. And that's what we have to do as a board member. But not only the board can't do that, it has to start with inside the organization, top down. It has to start saying, why do we do it this way? What's it about? We have to take a look at a whole budget process like that. That's why I say it's so important on priorities. Because priorities, when you set your priorities, and it's not on a priority list, you have to take a serious look at what that cost of that other program is that's not a priority. And that's the important part that we have to take, uh, take a real serious look at. I also want to say this too, um, 
when you develop the budget, and we've all been through budget processes, you start out there with your revenue, and then you start filling back in what the cost is. And those costs are those state mandates. That's an untouchable. You can't do anything about retirement costs. We can't do anything about that. Borrowing, sometimes we can do some things like borrowing. We can go out and find money cheaper, and we borrow at a lower rate, and it lowers our cost down. Those are things we have to start taking a look at. And that's the hard part about putting a budget together. First thing is you got to get your revenue. And that's why I'm saying a lot of lobbying has to be done right now with the state uh, assembly, state senate, and Governor Cuomo. They put the tax cap out here. And they're going to put the, for the school districts, but they set the parameters for us. But they have to come up there and say, okay, what do we got to do with our new state mandates if that's what it's costing us? And that's what it's really about in the budget. The budget is you require this, the contracts require this. Okay, how do we get around this to save some money? Because there is probably ways we can do it, but the, the mandates require us to do something else. So that's my pitch on uh, on what is untouchable, uh, what we have to do with the budget process. Thank you. I would consider to say that um, as we prepare the budget for 2012-2013, I would say that nothing is untouchable in the form that everything should be considered. For instance, if we're looking at core uh, curriculum, it's obviously a necessity. It's, it's mandated. It's all that. But if there's any waste within it, we should be we should be recognizing that instead of just saying, "Well, that's untouchable." We need to do things differently if we expect to to get it right, because it's not going to be easy to get it right, and therefore we got to look at everything. Take a look at how corporate America is doing it these days, and this is a big corporation. They're streamlining things. They're cutting back, and they're doing it, you know, in different ways. We have to start looking at different ways of doing things. Um, and then, and finally, I, I just said we, we have to reduce all waste, and that and that goes back to everything's on the table. There's nothing that's not untouchable, or that is untouchable, whatever that is. So. Okay, my question, what made it motivated you to show interest in being mem a member of the school board? Um, pretty much uh, answered that in my opening statement, the fact that, that I want to be proud of this district again. I want to be proud to say that, my, that I work in Hamburg, that I live in Hamburg. Um, Several people that I mentioned that I, had, I was going to be doing this looked at me and said, what are you, crazy? What are you, glutton for punishment? Why are you doing this? Because this is not a very um, sought-after position. I'm surprised, I'm glad, I'm pleased that we had as many candidates. Yeah, but um, for the most part, you become a pariah if you are part of the board or part of the administrative staff. And that's wrong. Um, I don't have the financial backing, but I've got the emotional and the inside knowledge that I can bring to the board. And I, I, I don't have a job outside of this. This would be my job. The fact that I am so locked in with so many students, the students that I taught in kindergarten are now graduating this year. And I see them on the street. I was walking before I came. And I saw a couple go by and they're, hey, Mr. Lane. You know, so I, I have a trust and an, a, a camaraderie and a connection with students and administrators or students and staff alike. And that's what I want to bring to the board. That's what I want to bring to you and be able to say, this is what's going on at the, at the grassroots level. This is what we need to pay attention to. That's what motivated me. Make it sure you're done. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could go on. Yeah, so that's a flag in me in a I'll, second. I'll use some time. I don't <laughs> you know, this, that's a very interesting question for all of us and uh, for everybody to apply out here. Um, obviously, I, I gave some reasons why I looked at the run, but the, there's there's more to that whole question to me. Uh, if you if you know me, I'm a seven habits guy. I believe in the seven habits of highly effective people. One of the big things it talks about is your sphere of influence and that circle of influence that you have. 
in being a board member, you have a great circle of influence out there. When you take that circle of influence, you can help out. You can expand. You can do career paths wall to wall. You can do guidance counselors and become true mentors out there. Those are things we have to take a look at our school districts and what we're doing with education. And that's why when I talk, we can't always do things, but you have to have those values as well to education and say what we're going to do with it. And that's an important part. Where are we going to take our education right now? These kids have to get ready for a global economy. They have to be able to compete with the Chinese, the Japanese, whatever economy is out there right now because the whole economy is changing because these little cell phones out here, they change everything in the world. We have to start thinking in that line. And that's what I want to bring to this board, and that's what I always try to bring to the community, no matter what I'm into. We can't go back to when Bob Reynolds graduated in 1972 from Frontier, yeah, 40 years. <laughs> Coming up, we're working on my reunion. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very different world from 1972 to, 19, to 2011. It truly is. And the kids are different. They're under different pressures. Our school districts are under pressure because of money problems. But we can get through it by synergy, by looking through our a circle of influence, and really working hard at changing education. For America to get better, it's the, there's problems all over this world right now. There truly is. But for us to get better, we have to change our education system. And I think that's where it starts, and that's why I really want to get back involved again. <coughs> Um, what motivated me? Uh, probably two words. My son. Because he is my world. But the interesting thing is, is how it just spirals or spider webs out. Because while my son is in the center motivating me to do this and to do other things for our community, it's also the, out, the next ring out, which are his friends. And then it's the parents of his friends. And then it's the teachers that support them. And then it's the administration out. And it just keeps growing and growing. And my son is the point at which I see all of this going in every direction. And it's for him and his friends and his teachers and parents and the community at large that I'm stepping forward once again. And this is uh, no different than what I said three and a half years ago. That's why. And basically, for your kids too. Okay. Um, I saw the article in the Sun and immediately went to the board briefings. Confirmed. I don't know if I didn't believe it or not. I was very surprised. And I didn't even hesitate. I thought, you know what? I care. I care so much about this community and this district. I have been um, <coughs> disappointed, um, embarrassed, and uh, I've just felt bad with some of the things that have happened in recent years. And it's really bothered me. And I was talking with a number of different parents on many different topics, all related to the school board, to the budget, to what's happening. And, just felt like something needs to change. Now, do I feel like I can be that change? You know what, maybe a little bit. Maybe a little bit. I think um, I can make a little bit of a difference. I think I can bring uh, to the board a little bit of what's going on out there. You know, my years at the middle school, Jeff Grace would, I, I, I'd go into his office, he'd always offer me coffee. I don't drink coffee, but he never understood that even after three years, he'd always <laughs> offer. And, as gracious as that was, but um, he would always start out by saying, asking me, so what's the word on the street? What's the word on the street? That's what he wanted to know. And, you know, he, he had a pretty good idea what was going on in his building with his staff and certainly with the students, but you know what? They didn't really have a handle on what was going on with the parents. And that's where I'm coming from. It's the parents. It's the community. It's uh, the people that are out there that support the district, and we need them back. Because I think if we're going to try to move forward and to be progressive and to fill those goals and the mission that has been set by uh, the district, we need the support of the community. And <coughs> that's what I want to represent. And that's what I think I can bring. Any other questions? Okay. 
Yes. Question number seven. With the recent publicity on bullying, what role should the school board play to address this problem? Yes, the role. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I kind of figured this would be one of the hot topics out there because I was watching what was going on. And I think the school board plays an important role in this. Um, and here's how I, I hear, here's how I think this needs to be played out. Right now, we need to truly take a look at how we are addressing this, starting at an elementary level, through the middle school, and up to the high school. We really need to see if we've done the right things in elementary school, <coughs> in the middle school, then at high school level, when they get to this age, and, and it's more at a high school level a lot of times, because they get into their peer groups. And when you get into peer groups, you start getting bullying pressure and everything else goes with it. That's, you know, that's the take I see on this. What we really need to take a look at is how we can start controlling this whole process all the way through school. When we get a kindergartner in, and we start seeing that peer pressure from a little kindergartner, whether they're on top of people or something, we need to start taking a serious look at that age. Because we need to change their whole character when they're young. It's harder to change people's character as they get older, because they get into habits. You know, the parents are at home too. The parents have a whole factor on this too at home. They're part of this whole process and they need to come at a young age and understand that. That you, you know, that you're here to set standards and if you start picking on people and you start picking on brothers and sisters and you start bullying people at a young age, it can continue through. So I don't know, and I'll be very honest, you know, it's been a while since I've been board. I don't know our true whole policy of how we take things through elementary to middle school to high school, but I know it's going to be a big issue for this board going forward. Uh, it's the, the standard and the bar has been raised very high <coughs> in happen out in Williamsville. Very, very high. And we need to address that so it doesn't happen in Hamburg. Uh, bullying comes along the same with the, you know, the, the drug problems. I mean, those are two issues that the school districts truly face out there, and they're tough issues. They are very tough issues for this community um, because it is a community issue. It's not just a school board issue, it's a school, community, parent issue all the way through. So that's the best way I can answer this right now, but I really think, and I'll, 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 since I got a little time, you know, we gotta say what we're doing from kindergarten through our elementary, then we bring them all together and they got new friends in the middle school, and then a whole new process starts. And Joanne talks about Jeff Grace being on top of things, that's what he had to be on top of. What's going on in that school, what's going on with parents. And then at the high school level, hopefully we've done so much training in high school that they, they, they uh, kind of get away from that tactic of what they're doing to <coughs> uh, fellow classmates. And that's the part that Kathy talked about, fellow classmates in, in the community. Thanks. Um, I think Bob is exactly right. Um, I think that it starts in kindergarten and in the elementary schools, and it transcends all the way up. And what I think the role of the board is, is to make sure that that actually happens. Presently at Union Pleasant, they have the, the Buddy Program. And I think it's one of the most incredible programs where a fifth grader, well, you know, the fifth grader takes on a, a kindergarten and walks them through the whole year. And what that does is it really says, you know what, age doesn't matter, and we become friends and all this stuff. And that progresses up the, up the uh, age to the middle school and where you have it. But what we don't have is cohesiveness through all the four elementary schools. Every elementary school has a different program. And so it's not consistent. We're not saying a consistent message about bullying. We're not saying a consistent message about you know who your friends are and, and how you treat people. We need to be consistent across the board at the district. And while I'm here on the subject, I think that we need to do a lot more of that schools, not just in uh, bullying and peer mentoring and all that. Curriculum needs to be the same. I know I'm okay. But um, we need to, we need to kind of get everyone, you know, single-minded, single message, consistent, so that when our, our, um, when our kids get to the high school, where, where this is really the biggest issue, I'm sure everyone heard that in today in West Hennigan something happened. And, um, you know, this, it's only a matter of time. You know, knock on wood, this doesn't happen, but it's only a matter of time. So consistency, I think, is, is what the board should be putting forth. Well, and I, I 
just say that uh, I'm sure when you say, I hope that this doesn't happen, you're referring to the tragedy because we know that bullying is happening in school. We're not naive to that. Um, and we certainly need to recognize that it is happening in our district as other things are happening. Um, we're not immune from any of the, the goings on of the world and how sad that is. But um, we do need to take that uniform policy and a uh, code of conduct and be willing to follow it and to enforce it. Um, to hear uh, with this story with the young man from Williamsville and his sister going to the homecoming dance and to still hear uh, remarks being made in that room. I couldn't understand why something wasn't done right there. There were adults there, there were teacher chaperones there. Why didn't they just take those kids right out of there at that time? They heard it too. I mean, are we just turning a blind you know, ear to this? I was shocked at that um, and really saddened by it. So I would hope that you know if the policy that we do have could be uh, looked at again, um, that something would become more uniform across the district, right up through uh, the different buildings, and um, that we find a way to not only stop it, but to teach these kids what they should be taught at home, but we know that doesn't always happen either but to find a way to reach out to them, whether it's through the peer mentoring or the other programs that are available, um, to change that attitude. I think we can do it. We're a good community. We're a decent community. For the most part, our kids are good kids here. Um, and if we can find a way to help them realize the goodness that they have and the potential that they have within them, then maybe we can focus on strengthening each individual instead of um, kind of looking the other way sometimes when things are said in classrooms or in hallways that are being heard by staff as well as other students. So if we can find a way to address it head on, I think we'll, we'll uh, best serving everybody in this situation, as well as the other things that can uh, plague our district as well, whether it be drugs or um, other activities that they shouldn't be engaging in. Well, we have a set of character traits that show up in a classroom every the beginning of every month. And for the most part, the character traits get, oh, let's see, I'm going to put it on top of the one that was there last month. And it never gets looked at, it never gets reviewed, it never gets talked about. Maybe in the elementary schools a little bit. But once it gets into the other buildings, it doesn't for the most part. There are, there's the exception that might go on a whole board for a while. Um, the respect for each other as students is abysmal, to say the least, especially in the middle school. The middle school is such a, a hormonal up and down and around and around. Um, I feel so badly for those kids most of the time. They're crying one minute and laughing the next. If we can foster respect for each other, not only in the, in the elementary schools, but get them into that middle school where they all come together and they have to start looking at each other as human beings and not the enemy from another building. We would go a long way, in particular in the, in the middle school, this is something that has bothered me for a long, long time. The middle school lunches are 22, min 22 minutes long or so. So they're, they're actually changing and going to a, a deer time to read while there are classes going on in the hallways. And the kids come out of their cafeteria like wild banshees. They yell, they scream, they slam lockers all the way down the hall, and the teachers who are trying to teach <coughs> core subject matters in those hallways have to shut their doors, the children are distracted, and that has bothered me from day one. That's one of my pet peeves in that building. Um, as a substitute, when the children walk in, they're like, oh, man, I've got a sub. This is awesome. And so they try to do everything they can to not do what they're supposed to. And very often, I'll go to a doorway, and I'll go, see that line? When you cross that line, you are now in the land of Lee. The land of Lee inside this room, when I am here, is different than the rest of the hallway. In the land of Lee, you have rules to follow. And 
And if I can get that into them, then they have to be polite and they can't bully because they know it's not going to be allowed. That is a safe room for the time period I have them. We have to get that philosophy and that attitude in every single building and let them know that there are consequences. Let them know it's not going to be, be you know, oh, no, I didn't see that, you know, the kids got to grow up, whatever, you better toughen up. That's not going to work. There is now a, an, a, okay, I'll leave that for later. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> we'll put this up here for closing statement. <laughs> Sorry, something I'm very passionate about. Here it's starting with Matt. Right. What are your plans in running for election and main and maintaining your position on the board? What are your plans in running for election and maintaining your position on the board? Well. Plans for that are to finish <laughs> out tonight. Um, um, see how he goes for y'all on Thursday. You know what? I'm available. As you all know, I work. Uh, I work from home. I have plenty of clients, but I can have a flexible schedule. Um, making school lunches and making meetings and stuff like that is it's not a problem for me. So, if that's answering your question, I'm available. I think the other portion of that question is, if you were to be chosen to join us now, would your thoughts be that in the next chapter, you would see this as an interlude where you were with us for six to eight months, or would you figure that, what the heck, probably you'll try to sign on for another year or two or three I'm pretty ten. sure I can run again. You have two more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm good. I'm really good. <laughs> Reynolds, I've watched you enough. <laughs> I am in it for the long haul. You know what? My daughter has uh, the opportunity in a year, my older daughter, to come back out here. Her husband is um, hoping to be accepted to UB's dental program. And that's going to put them here for a good five years, but he's doing pediatrics, so that's a little more time. So we have. Uh, 